the topic really um, excited me when I really first saw that the vaccine was coming out, honestly, um, when the vaccine started to be promoted and different media sources were picking it up and talking about it as this promising uh, cancer prevention um, tool. I did read chapter two, mm. you're talking about, mm. you know, what about the boys? And um I was curious, do you think or did you find in your research that maybe pop culture is the way to talk about HPV and normalize it? Because you meant you referenced the TV show Girls and and how they um, dealt with the topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think pop culture and science aren't actually all that different, right? They're both kind of telling stories that have really important health education messaging, also really important consequences for who gets to sort of like be the subject of the of the topic and then to come to medicine you know as a result so i do think that pop culture was a main uh medium of picking up the pharmaceutical messaging um, pharmaceutical companies really in in the case of the vaccines rollout were to me and in my research a kind of primary driver of health education, at least in the US where, where most of mm -hmm. my work is really, it's sort of landed in the US. Um, so those messaging is by pharmaceutical companies, but then um, popular culture was sort of picking it up and trying to make sense of this for publics, right? For various different kinds of audiences and, and girls, since you brought it up, was really trying to parse it for, you know, young adult, you know, sexually active women, um, that was their target audience. Um, and they did a pretty good job. You know, they, 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 you know, constructed a, a story that that made sense, but also and had some issues that, you know, I talk about in the book, but, but for the most part, they're bringing the conversation about sex, and about sexual transmission uh, forward. But until HPV, you didn't really think about cancer as a sexually transmitted right you didn't think about those routes of transmission and so you know i also was taken by that as as um as so many people's lives were reshaped as well um that to understand cancer in this in this different way and so popular culture and others were taking it up and i think how they did so is important for bringing people into the conversation when you mentioned the pharmaceuticals um, and how how yeah. Merck, for example, decided to promote the um, the HPV vaccine, especially expanding it out to boys, and they they stuck with this this kind of campaign. This is the cancer vaccine. It seems like that would have been um, the wise um, strategy to ignore all the controversial aspects of the vaccine, but it didn't quite work. Um, can you, in your research, were you able to determine why not, or at least? Well, I mean, I think in some ways it's really because of the facts of the kind of epidemiological facts of the of the numbers. I mean, the the boys who would later be getting cancers, and um, you know, as you know, oral pharyngeal cancers and anal cancers. Um, you know, they're very rare cancers where cervical cancer in women is a cancer that that in women we're more familiar with, right? And the numbers are, are larger. And so I do think that, that in part, you know, like you said, it kind of made sense um, that that this was a harder sell is something that I often say, like, how are we going to sell this from Merck's perspective? Um, and from a sort of popular understanding perspective. Uh, but for boys and girls, I mean, the more proximate issue is a sexually transmitted infection, you know, one that goes unnoticed often, but one that also um, can be shown in sort of the non-cancerous um, uh, genital warts. And so there's a conversation that can happen that, that was, that didn't happen. <laughs> And so I think there was a bit of that that could have happened with boys and just got very complicated and murky, I think, because of this refusal to sexualize. I mean, when I say sexualize, I think it can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing. It's not always stigmatizing to sexualize. Uh, I think that we need more sexualization in some ways of health and illness um, when uh, that's the 
transmission routes, and that's also the implications for people's bodies and lives. When you talked about the tension between what you called we, public health, and me, clinical mm -hmm. medicine, and that whole thing being, um, you know, working against each other as opposed to working together. Can you speak to that and how it relates to this whole HPV um, cancer crisis? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that the context is really important in thinking about the kind of late 20th century, but 21st century medicine where, um, you know, there's a difference between public health or pop, what we call population public health, where we're thinking about the sort of uh, prevention of sort of mass public health, which is like vaccines. Vaccines are a mass public health tool. Um, but yet, in this era, I suppose that that we all live in and that HPV came around in, there's a lot of this kind of individualized healthcare, you know, how to balance risks and benefits for the for the me for for my health. Um, and with vaccines, there's that tension. So it's in the popular, I want to say imaginary, but I, I don't mean it I mean, that's a concept that is often used, but in the popular way of understanding things, um, you're not so interested in the in the population health. You really want to know like, well, how it's going to benefit me. Um, and so pharmaceutical companies would advertise like, how is this going to be benefit the you? How can we prevent cancer in you, in your son, in your daughter, like from their individual risk? you know, that would be 20 years down the road. Now, COVID so different because it's immediate, right? I mean, we don't have the latency period um, of, of an airborne illness, uh, but at the same time, we saw the politics of, of what's in it for me, um, you know, really break out where um, we really needed to address and educate as I think that it's a question for you and your organization, <laughs> like how to really educate about that it can be both a we and a me um, simultaneously. There's an evolution in thought, like all of a sudden people both wanting to prevent cancer, but also being diagnosed with certain cancers were like all of us, like, oh, you know, this was a, a new way of thinking about the causal association and it didn't have to be, um, you know, shattering or surprising. I mean, it's just is um, a matter of our human lives as sexual beings. Um, and, and that, but nonetheless, the doctors and the scientists that I talked to were a bit perplexed, like, oh, like, I don't know how to do that education, or I've never had to talk about that in my practice before. Cervical cancer seems to have now be normalized. It's people understand it, they wrap their hearts around it. Whereas the other cancers, yeah. such as, you know, head and neck, anal, any other kind um, that we're talking about still is sitting there all kind of, you know, like the, the outcasts in the room. Um, you know, when, with your conversations with him, I'm just wondering if, you know, you, you, you could shed any light on that. Like, why aren't all cancers equal? A chapter of the book really looks at anal cancer prevention and the politics around that. And that takes a very different um, historical thread than the politics around cervical cancer. I mean, even though cervical cancer had its own, like, legacy of suspicion of sexuality and and some stigmatization of women and, and their lives in terms of their sexual lives. Anal cancer for women and men. I mean, anal cancer, we all have an anus. And I think that's something that Joel Pileski likes to say as well. <laughs> so I may be quoting him. Right? Yeah. Anal cancer is something that affects us all. Um, but the research shows that while women have the higher kind of burden of anal cancer, the kind of rates are are also higher in uh, men who have sex with men who are HIV positive. And so there's different kind of uh, uh, risk groups or risk stratifications, as we say, and we need to have conversations about it. I mean, we need to sort of understand it and, and destigmatize um, anal cancer for all genders. I really wanted to talk about that the particularities matter, that the way this happens is not a generalized story, 
um, for for all people, but it, it really lands differently and the way it lands on different bodies matters. If there was a cancer vaccine for any other kind of cancer that wasn't related to an STI, um, did your research reveal that, you know, we wouldn't be in the same position? Interesting. Um, you know, that's a great question, you know, and not necessarily one that I took up, although I think the whole question that I did take up is, was it because it's an, S, an sexually transmitted um, a causality model. And so I would say, but I didn't say then, that it would be taken up. I mean, we wouldn't have the same politics around uh, HPV. And so, you know, my hope is really that we can both uh, reach people who are thinking about these cancers, um, but at the same time, reach people to talk about sexuality and sexual transmission. Um, and that you know, organizations like yours is a prime hope of mine, um, you know, that, that, you know, these organizations can really um, find the conversations to help with their goals. Um, and that whether that's health education or increasing vaccination rates, or really de-stigmatizing sexuality and its relation to health and illness.